This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, October 16th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the state experiences its highest daily report of COVID-19 in nearly two months, realizing predictions by health officials earlier this week. Then, in observance of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we examine the progress of cancer research. Plus, on the morning of the Great Shakeout, a small earthquake was detected near Columbus. We survey the ground to determine what causes seismic activity in Mississippi. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Coronavirus cases are rising in Mississippi, and experts say the state could be on the verge of a second wave of the virus. And that prognosis took one step closer to fruition yesterday, as the Department of Health reported 1,322 new cases of COVID-19. That's the highest single-day total since August 19th. During a virtual press conference Monday, State Health Officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs indicated the state was on the verge of a Another wave. I'm actually very concerned that this is um, we're going into a phase. I mean, it's kind of like reading the stock market. Sometimes you don't really know what's going to happen, but um, but we do have some indicators, right? And all the indicators are looking in the wrong direction. We have hospitalizations are up, cases are up, deaths are not really up so much, um, but we always know that lags, um, and we know that our COVID-like illness indicators are up. So um, the last time we saw that was before the summer surge. So. It is a worrisome indicator, um, but it doesn't mean we can't turn it around. It's just a matter of what we choose to do, and hopefully we'll choose to do the the right stuff because it's not that hard. We just have to have a little bit of patience and and just restrict some of the things we do. State epidemiologist Dr. Paul Byers says the data suggests the upward trend is a result of community transmission. I think what we're seeing is is a number of counties um, throughout the state where we're starting to see increases or are starting to see them on the plus side of those numbers of cases if we look over a, a one week and a two week um, trend. And I think that's just another indicator that we're also starting to see community transmission. Not all of the cases that we're seeing now are necessarily tied to an event or a cluster or an outbreak that, in fact, we're, we're starting to see, um, you know, the, the same type of transmission we saw before. We are seeing, you know, some, some isolated um, clusters still around uh, colleges and universities. And, and certainly, you know, we've worked with K-12 schools throughout the state around um, a number of clusters and outbreaks that have occurred in uh, different settings within the schools. And so, um, you know, I think we're just we're just seeing uh, a broader community transmission. And when we see that, we start to identify more clusters associated with that. Cases and hospitalizations are metrics commonly used to measure how well the state is handling the virus. But Dr. Dobbs says ex- excess deaths in 2020, which were trending in a positive direction after the summer peak, are also on the rise again. This, according to Dobbs, means people are dying from COVID. It looked like our excess deaths were starting to get worse again. Um, so um, from COVID and also from all cause mortality. So, you know, just to reiterate, coronavirus is absolutely killing people. Um, you know, please don't listen to the silliness, um, you know, about, you know, it's not coronavirus killing people. Um, and if you ask anybody who works in the hospital or ICU, um, they would be so angry to hear that because they're having to sit with the families while people are dying from coronavirus um, day in, day out. Uh, and my wife runs an ICU, and and I and, and she sees it every day. Um, you know the, the struggles that we're going through. So, um, but yeah, go to our website. You can see the, the uh, excess deaths. We're trying to get as much good information like that out for you guys on a regular basis. The reversal, of course, comes two weeks after Governor Tate Reeves allowed the statewide mask mandate to expire. Dobbs is encouraging local leaders to consider ordinances to mask up. You know, I'm always happy to see uh, 
see a, a county or a, a city um, take um, <laughs> take initiative for non-pharmaceutical intervention, interventions, and that's stuff that keeps people from spreading it to another. So um, not a bad idea to have um, local mask ordinances, not a bad idea to look at crowd sizes and that sort of thing. I mean, those are the things that are really get, getting us is our, um, it's indoor stuff with people who um, uh, aren't wearing masks. Um, and, and, I, and some of the stuff that we've seen, which I've been, I thought was really great, I know like in Oxford, um, uh, the mayor work to have more outdoor dining. Fantastic. Let's find a way that we can live but live more safely because I know people want to do stuff, but if we can find innovative ways to keep people from being in large groups indoors without masks, that's fantastic. Mississippi has reported over 108,000 cases of COVID-19 since March 11th with 3,152 related deaths. Coming up in observance of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we examine the progress of cancer research. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. With nearly 1.3 million people diagnosed annually, breast cancer continues to be one of the most prevalent cancers in the world today. But through heightened awareness, early detection, and improved treatment methods, people have a greater chance of survival than ever before. Catherine Young of Susan G. Komen, Memphis, Mid-South, Mississippi, says progress has been made through research efforts. We've been making a lot of uh, progress. Um, research and, and cre- breast cancer, any type of cancer, is one of those ones that is a complex uh, situation. Um, every no one cancer, breast cancer, or no one's person breast cancer is the same. Um, so finding you know therapies that are, are tailored to individual um, person has been a a cha- definitely a challenge. So for research, finding different um, medicines uh, to treat breast cancer, finding different avenues has definitely progressed. From years back when breast cancer was um, a taboo and such a deadly word to now that we have more treatment options, we are making progress every day, but we can't pump the brakes right now uh, on our research. We got to continue to move forward with those research and, and make viable changes but that all is taking a process which you know there is not a cure right now paint a picture of breast cancer in mississippi who's most likely to get it the survival rate the number of those with breast cancer in mississippi um, african-american women are more likely to die from breast cancer due to late stage. There are a number of factors that impact African-Americans here in Mississippi. And uh, one of the things that we find through our community profile and these analysis is the lack of access to uh, breast cancer screening um, programs for low-income and underserved women. Um, So income plays a factor. Um, We know that um, our faith pays a factor um, because a, a lot of women believe that, you know, what they don't understand or hear, then it doesn't impact them. So um, we're working in order to ensure that um, women understand their risk factors and offer the screening if they need it, especially for those women who can't afford it or who don't have insurance. And what we know is that uh, many women, especially African-American women, delay screenings because of the lack of the ability to pay. And that's why and, you uh, said that earlier that, that African-American women die from breast cancer because of the late stage. So they're not being treated until it's reached a late stage because of um, the, the non-screening? Correct. 
So um, if I uh, paint a picture for a woman, if you have a 40 year old woman who, um, of course, have uh, children who has no no insurance um, and doesn't qualify for any of the programs that are out there, then um, that woman typically will take care of her family instead of going, you know, paying. Even when in October we have a lot of you know places that offer reduced cost screenings, but just the mere take a hundred dollars and pay for a screening is a lot for a woman who's feeding her family and, and just can't afford that. So, uh, you know, that woman will delay her screening um, just because she she doesn't have the funds. And, and when it's actually diagnosed or she shows up in a Mississippi hospital, um, typically that's at a stage four. And that's where we see a lot of the late stage metastatic breast cancer. And those women treatment options are um, much dimmer than they would be if it was caught at an earlier stage, stage one or stage zero. And so we know that uh, African Americans here in Mississippi are being impacted um, by not having those resources and those screenings in order to get diagnosed at an earlier stage. Catherine Young is the Senior Vice President of Susan G. Komen, Memphis, Mid-South, Mississippi. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. And Catherine says Susan B. Komen Foundation supports the expansion of Medicaid in order to provide wider health access to women in need. Coming up, on the morning of the Great Shakeout, a small earthquake was detected near Columbus. We survey the ground to determine what causes seismic activity in Mississippi. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. We are a Yucca Drive-In Theater. We're the last operating drive-in in the state of Mississippi. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. Freaked me out that you could come and drive your car and park and watch the movie outside. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app, Mile Marker, a Mississippi Roads podcast. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. The number of earthquakes known to have occurred within Mississippi's boundaries is small, but the state has been affected by numerous shocks in neighboring states, including one yesterday, 30 miles east of Columbus. The 2.6 quake occurred the day of the Great Shakeout, a nationwide effort focused on earthquake preparedness. Dr. Ron Counts is with the University of Mississippi. He explains what causes seismic activity in the region with our Michael Guidry. So the seismicity in, in, in the Mississippi area is what we call an intraplate setting. Most earthquakes are associated at the boundaries between two tectonic plates. But here in Mississippi, in the central United States, there is no tectonic plate boundary. It's in the middle of a plate, and we call it an intraplate boundary. And we don't really know a lot about those earthquakes. But what we do know is that in this area, there are a lot of ancient faults, old faults, um, from the Precambrian even. And what's happening is, um, since we are in the middle of a plate, it is being stressed on its edges. And so those old faults are are zones of weakness. And those are what are causing the earthquakes that we feel here. Geologically speaking, I know that these are things that take a long, 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 long time to develop. What should Mississippians know about like seismic activity uh, you know, in the near future, are, are we going to see more seismic activity, more earthquakes um, because of what you just mentioned? Or is it something that's just going to kind of stay the course um, over the lifetime of, uh, of of a few generations? Oh, we're not sure exactly, but it's probably more likely going to be stay the course. So um, the earthquakes that we feel um, are fr- from stress and strain, from tectonic plate movement, and, and the amount of strain that we feel are that, that is actually measured is on the order of uh, millimeters per year. So um, in uh, 1811, 1812, up near New Madrid, Missouri, there were three very strong earthquakes that are comparable to the earthquakes that they have on the East Coast, and those were on the New Madrid Fault. And that's a fault that we think over time had been building up all of this strain and a, a few millimeters per year. And then finally, there was a threshold reached where the fault failed, and it created a very large series of earthquakes. And that will probably continue for, for uh, geologically speaking. We do have earthquakes there almost every day. They're usually between magnitude one and two. 
but there is still seismic activity there. But that's good that we do have those small earthquakes. That means that the fault isn't locked up and accumulating all that strain again. Well, what are some of the telltale signs that uh, Mississippians should be on the lookout for to kind of understand and recognize that they might be experiencing a quake? Uh, well, if it's a strong earthquake, of course, you know, you'll feel the ground rumble, you'll shake, and you'll probably hear it maybe before you feel it. That's what a lot of people have reported. Big earthquakes, um, things might shake and fall off the wall, um, even even moderate earthquakes. Things will shake, perhaps fall off the wall. You can have a um, glass break. Um, fixtures, anything on the ceiling that's not fixed well can fall. And so you have a hazard, things fall on your head. So that's why you want to get some place and duck and cover. You get under a table, get under a desk, get in a doorway if the, those things aren't available so that something can't fall on your head. And that's what you do during an earthquake. And if, if you can get outside, you should, should get out of the building in case there's a gas leak. You never know if there's a gas leak that could start a fire. And you don't want to go back into a building because there could be an aftershock and you have a structurally weakened building that hits another aftershock and it could fall and, and injure you that way. If you're in an earthquake, you typically know it. Well, Dr. Ronald Counts, uh, Associate Director of the Mississippi Mineral Resources Institute, I thank you so much for uh, shedding some light on the seismic activity in Mississippi. Uh, you're welcome. The Mississippi Emergency Management Agency says over 150 schools participated in yesterday's shakeout drill. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening. This is Mississippi Edition from MPB 